What up, Fight World? It's your boy Ego, and I'm back with some more boxing. Make sure you smash the like button. Also, hit the subscribe button. Today is Monday, which means Boxing Ego's Monday Mail Day. And I put a thumb up next to the question I'm going to answer. We had a fight. Adonis Superman Stevenson showed the first fight wasn't a fluke. Handled Andres from far even better than he did in the first fight. The first fight was competitive. This one was not. He got a second round knockout. Let's get to some questions. I don't know how long this one's going to be. A lot going on. But let's get started. First question, King Jones. What's up, Ego? Love how you keep it real in all your videos. Why, thank you. Two questions. First, after a dominant performance from Adonis Stevenson, do you see him beating Ward or Kovalev? Second, should the winner of Garcia versus Broner fight Bud Crawford? Thanks, Ego. Keep up the great content. First part of your question. Adonis, he has a shot versus Ward or Kovalev. I think he has a better shot stylistically with Kovalev. Kovalev can box, but Kovalev is not as athletic. He did gas out in his first Ward fight. We got to obviously see how he looks, and that might change my opinion. But Stevenson can crack, and anytime you have that type of power, you're in it with anyone, and that's including Ward. But I think Ward would be, that would be more of a headache for Adonis Stevenson's style. Like you look at from far, he came out way too aggressive in in the rematch and he paid for it. Ward, he's aggressive, but he'll smother, I think he'll try to smother Stevenson's left hand. And he could switch hit more than I've seen Kovalev do. I haven't really seen Kovalev turn southpaw, right? So Kovalev can box, but I think with his style and stuff, and and keep in keep in mind, some people forget little little moments like Keith Thurman when he got clipped versus Jesus Soto Caras, he got buzzed a little bit, right? Sergey Kovalev, he got clipped, and I think he was hurt in the first John Pascal fight. And there's nothing wrong with that; these guys are decent punchers, but people forget it because it's overshadowed because Keith Thurman went on to have a great highlight reel knockout of Jesus Soto Caras. Same with Kovalev. He, he stopped Pascal in that first fight in a devastating fashion in his backyard. So sometimes people forget. But I see that and I pay attention to that. Kovalev's not invincible. You know what I mean? He was hurt in the Pascal fight, the first fight. But he's tough. He buckled down, got back to what he knows how, and he stopped Pascal. So shout out to him for that. But I think both fights would be difficult. Ward Kovalev winner versus Stevenson. But I think just because Stevenson's more left-hand dominant, if you can find a way to suppress that, then you're going to have a shot to definitely beat him, right? And Kovalev and Stevenson have a mutual opponent in Darnell Boone, so it could be interesting. Kovalev, like I said, Kovalev can box. I don't know for a fact, but I think the athleticism and style of Stevenson put up with Kovalev, I think if he were to beat, and this is not saying he will beat Ward or Kovalev, but I am saying out of the two, I think Ward's style, he just does more, he's athletic, and just a dif different rhythm than Kovalev, so I think Stevenson has a better shot to beat Kovalev, that's just my opinion, plus Kovalev has a loss, and if he loses again to Ward, who knows what that'll do with his confidence. Second part of your question, Garcia Broner, should they fight Terrence Crawford? I mean, why not? I would love to see that. That would be an amazing fight. Crawford already fought and beat Mikey Garcia and his cousin in the amateurs, right? But AMs are the AMs and the pros are the pros, so we'll see. But the, the only problem is Bud Crawford probably is getting stronger and sharper than when he was an amateur. He, you know what I mean? So it's not like he's regressed. Some guys look great in the amateurs and then getting to wars or something as a pro he's he's looking better and better right fighting the perfect fight so those would be hard fights for garcia or broner to win but they can make them competitive but I, I mean why not i would love to see it i'm sure the fans would too next question is from brent leora leorna what does the stevenson win really mean to the division that was his eighth title defense, but it just seems like he would be outclassed by Ward and maybe not able to stop Kovalev. 
shouldn't rank fighters and belt holders be required to fight a certain number of fights per year against other belt holders or rank fighters? It seems promoters and networks have more control over the matchups and rankings. What can fans do to help encourage that change? Seems like a lot of guys like you, Igor, are stepping up their game. Do you ever beef with bigger news organizations? Okay, that's a different question. Bigger news organizations? Do they act stuck up around you? How do you promoters? How do the promoters act around you? I get my information from y'all, so if you ain't getting the good spots, how do we help to get you to more media events and fight days? Of course, who is next for Adonis Stevenson? Very good questions, very detailed questions. I appreciate when you guys take the time out of your day to leave these questions. What does a Stevenson win really mean to the division? Well, I would say it means a lot. See, this is this is me. When it comes to boxing, I love the sport. I'm not an emotional person like that. You know what I mean? Some people even, if I respond to anybody in a comment, like if they say some slick stuff and I leave a comment and respond, people are like, oh, I must have really, I must have really affected you i must have really offended you and got under your skin i've been doing this listen i've been doing this way too long you guys can't get under my skin with comments i've been called everything under the book racist things a bitch a pussy you know what i mean people said they're gonna knock me out all types of stuff i'm a vlogger i'm really not hard to find i'm where i say i am i live stream in different cities and stuff you know what i mean i travel so like you know what i mean i'm not comments don't affect me like that once you once you've been doing this as long as i've been doing this you become desensitized to it and numb to it so it's like you mean i get i just block people talking too crazy i just block them and be done with it and go to chipotle right after and get the double meat extra guacamole you know what i mean but people in the social media age they just talk reckless and very just like fueled with emotion like Danny Garcia, he he can't get beyond this Rod Salka fight, and it, people start bringing in things. Look at Danny Garcia's resume. Look at him as a fighter. You can't say he doesn't show heart. You can't say he's not trying. You can't say any of those things. He's a warrior, but people start bringing in his dad and his dad yelling and ponytail and I speak the truth and all this stuff. Like that don't have nothing to do with Danny Garcia's fight style. That has nothing to do with his resume. He took a soft, 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 soft touch in Rod Salka, but doesn't mean his resume is trash, but yet fans say he's a cherry picker. And people go overboard with Adonis Stevenson. Yes, like you said, eight title defenses, and none of them have really been the best fights that we want to see. You know what I mean? The Joe Smith Juniors, the Better B of obviously Kovalev, Ward, but he's still getting in there. And these guys, Thomas Top Dog Williams, had a knockout of the year that particular year against Edwin Rodriguez. And he knocked him out. And I don't think Rodriguez had been knocked out as a pro. And he knocked him out badly. I was there. I was in the front row. And he then fought Adonis Stevenson. And uh, Adonis Stevenson chopped him up. So you got to give credit. Like, some people get mad. And they don't even know all the facts. As far as I'm concerned, with the Stevenson-Kovalev fallout, I think initially Stevenson's side made it complex because he left the network. You know what I mean? He was no longer part of HBO and he left before making the fight and stuff but then it got to a point where you have to give them both the blame because main events pushed for a purse bid they got it and then as soon as it went to the purse bid and it looked like PBC wasn't trying to pull out or vacate the belt Donna Stevenson wasn't like not trying to do that then main event said you know what we don't want to risk PBC winning the purse bid and winning the auction and the fight not being on HBO because if PBC wins, they could put it on their network and establish the venue within a certain time and, and the place and times and stuff. And main events pulled out. So if Kovalev really wanted the Stevenson fight, then they should have never pushed for a purse bid that they weren't going to see through. So a lot of people don't even know the facts and they, they just pin, it, pin the tail on the donkey, so to speak. And a Stevenson win to me means a lot still because since the Darnell Boone loss, He's been smoking, and some of the guys are, are still decent, good competition, like Thomas Top Dog Williams, Saki Obika, you know what I mean? Like, there's some names, Fanfara, and just stopping him. is not, like, just the easiest person, you know what I mean? He's a big dude, a method dude, you know what I mean, in the Virgil Hunter gym, stuff like that. So, to me, he's a champion. The win still means a lot. I don't know what the fans can really do to 
to push for what they want but just make your voice be heard and like if you really feel compelled then don't support something i mean don't buy tickets to it don't watch it don't go to videos that have anything to do with it stuff like that and then the promoters will get the picture like man our events are tanking our, our viewership's going down that's how you hurt them you know what i mean so that's what fans can do but like floyd mayweather mcgregor if you hate it so much why are you on the videos every time i do a video because i'm going to be covering it i'm going to get paid off of it you know what i mean and i don't mind watching it as a as a reporter and a fan because i think both guys i like both guys and i think they'll both entertain me so i'm not tripping off of it if it happens this is just it's not for to my knowledge any real titles or it's not even a done deal so we're getting so much great boxing that's just extra to me it'd be one thing if it was like a shit year like 2015 or something and then that that was the only fight like i'd be like wow this but I'm already getting what I want as a boxing fan. Kell Brook, Errol Spence, Canelo Golovkin, Joshua Klitschko. I'm already getting a ton of great fights. Ward Kovalev rematch. Broner versus Mikey Garcia. So, I mean, like I said, Mayweather McGregor is just icing on the cake. That's just an extra fight that'll pass time and entertain me while, while it's doing that. But back to the initial question, I think a win over Stevenson does matter. He's a champion, and like you said, he has eight title defenses or whatever it is, and he doesn't look easy to beat. He beat Tavor's Cloud, stopped him. I think he stopped him. I'm pretty sure he stopped him. But he's boxing the fuck out of him. So that's what fans can do to me, is if they see stuff they don't like, then don't support it. And you said, I'm stepping on my game. Do you ever beef with bigger news organizations nah i mean i'm a grown-ass man i don't have beef if someone has a problem with me i'm i'm at like i said i'm a vlogger i'm not hard to find i'm easy you know what i mean to locate i make it be known where i'm at i'm you know what i mean i'm not with no crazy 90 people entourage or something like that and do they act stuck up around you like honestly i really don't pay attention to what other people are doing when i go to cover events this is work this is my job you know what i mean this is just like any other job where i'm there for a mission i have a purpose i know some of the fighters now and the trainers i'm networking i don't really give a fuck what other people are doing you know what i'm saying again if there's anyone had an issue i'm not hard to find you know what i mean so i don't really observe i'm observant of my surroundings but i don't really care what who's mad or you know what i mean you're always going to have haters or people that don't, they don't like what you're doing or he's not a real rep fans say that sometimes ego you're not a real reporter like okay call me whatever you want just don't call me broke so i don't care call me a reporter or a vlogger or nobody i don't care that doesn't change the reality of the situation and that's i go to fights i get in for free i'm up in my catalog and just meeting people and networking so i don't really care you know what i mean people can say whatever they want about me but usually the ones that have that i have seen that make videos or diss me sometimes people send i don't watch that shit. but the ones i have seen they're nowhere even in the the stratosphere of what i'm doing they don't have nowhere near the subscriber count or viewership so you ain't gonna piggyback off my name how do promoters act around you? Again, I have a good relationship with everybody that I've, you know what I mean, promoters. I'm, I'm a businessman. Like, I don't I don't really have turmoil and getting kicked out of events and stuff like that. So, I would say all that's been good, top rank. Anytime I went to any PBC event, you know what I mean, I don't have no issues. Next question, Owen Brown. Ego, with Adonis Stevenson defeating Fonfara, what's potentially next for him? I naturally say Andre Ward, but Ward continues to downplay fighting Adonis Stevenson, which in my eyes is a monstrous fight. Ward has mentioned several times that Stevenson missed out on his opportunity against Kovalev, but as I recall, Team Stevenson won the first bid, and in response to Kathy Duva, and Team Kovalev walked away from negotiations. Ultimately, what does this have to do with Andre Ward potentially fighting Adonis Stevenson and unifying the division? I think that's a huge fight at 75 if Ward can defeat Sergey Kovalev in a couple of weeks. Yeah, um, Owen, to me, that I don't know what was said wholeheartedly because I don't remember Ward downplaying. So I don't know. I, I'd have to see a link or the dialogue or whatever, the video interview where he was downplaying him, whatever you're referring to. I have heard 
stuff like I was at the Kovalev war fight so I talked to Ward after and he was somebody asked him something about Stevenson and the only thing I remember him saying was something to the effect of because Stevenson called him out he said I think Ward won the fight I want to fight Ward and he he just said something to the effect of why are you getting so boisterous and raw raw now but you didn't want to fight Kovalev you know what I'm saying like I, I moved up. I wasn't even in the division. Moved up and fought Kovalev. Now, all of a sudden, you want to get on the horn. And this this is my moment. This ain't about Adonis Stevenson. So I don't really care what he's doing. That's the only thing. And that to me, that's not really downplaying him. It, it, it's actually a good point. Is how come a guy who wasn't even in the division end up fighting Kovalev before Stevenson, who's been in the division? And they have, like I said, the mutual opponent in Darnell Boone. So, I mean, realistically, your question, we, we have to see, like... We don't even know if Ward beats Kovalev in the rematch. It's, it's that type of fight. It's a good fight. Kovalev's mean. He's a great boxer. He has power. He's ill-willed, right? So, I mean, it doesn't even make sense to get too far into the dialogue of Ward or Kovalev versus Donna Stevenson when we have a major 50-50 fight where some people felt it was controversial. You know what I mean? So, Stevenson, we have to see what happens in the upcoming fight before we start like predicting Ward will definitely win because I don't think it's a, a gimme fight I don't think Kovalev is not training you know what I mean so at the end of the day we got to see what happens there first before we move on to any other order of business next question Jack C 3d what's up ego congrats on getting over 80,000 subs thank you you're doing a great job as usual thank you again my questions are after such a great performance against Pascal do you think that a leader Alvarez has what it takes to defeat someone like Kovalev or any of the the type fighters at 175? I guess you meant top fighters. Any of the type fighters at 175. Also, do you think Pascal should retire? Now, I mean, I don't really do the whole... I can say my opinion all day. I think Roy Jones should have retired. He's my favorite fighter, right? But at the end of the day, these fighters are going to do whatever they want anyway. You know what I mean? Like... Pascal, you could say he should retire, but there's people in me, in my opinion, there's people in line ahead of him. Victor Chinian, um, Juan Ma Lopez, like those guys are ahead of him, Pascal, in, in line of retiring. Now, in my honest opinion, do I think Pascal will beat the top guys at 75? The Wards, the Kovalevs, the... Well, he already lost to Kovalev, but if he were to have a trilogy or something, um, the Vod Sticks, the Arter Better Bievs, no, I don't see that. I don't see him beating those type of guys because he has some mileage, you know what I mean? Bernard Hopkins fights, Chad Dawson, Kovalev, or, you know what I mean? He, the Uniska of Gonzalez, he has some mileage on him. He could still get money, you know what I mean? He didn't look that trash, like, to the point where I'm like, oh, this calls for retirement. You know what I'm saying? He went the distance with a guy who's more in prime and can box from Columbia with respectable power, taller, look bigger to me, stuff like that. So, I mean, I don't think it's not screaming. Like, Vic Darchinian, he's, he's starting to get knocked out frequently. That's when, to me, like, okay, he needs to retire because he keeps fighting. He's fighting, like, people. At first, he was getting knocked out by people I knew like Nicholas Walters, Donaire rematch, stuff like that. But then he started getting knocked out. You know what I mean? Cuellar knocked him out. I know him. But then he started getting knocked out after that by other people I'd never even heard of. So I'm like, uh, that's it's probably time. But Pascal didn't look crazy. He was still stealing some rounds. I don't, like I said, I don't think he's a top of the division. I don't think he beats the top five guys. But he can still make some money in this game. So I'm not going to tell him he has to bounce. And I don't, and like I said, I think if, if we're talking about retirement, there's other people in line that are ahead of it. I mean, even Kell Brook, I hate to say, he he might be more, because I don't know what kind of psychological damage he's taken in his last two fights on top of the physical damage. So, you know what I mean? Pascal's always in shape, still looks cut up. I, like I said, went the distance. Brook got stopped in his last two fights, so it's a little bit different. The first part of your question, Leader Alvarez, it, it's very hard because I, I can't. I can't judge off of Pat because like I said Pascal has mileage on him there's a great performance is what he needed in his career but I can't say he'll beat Kovalev or Ward or the top guys at 75 
off of beating Pascal. You know what I mean? It, it's similar to like it would be a, a, a forecast. It's like Errol Spence. Errol Spence, he beat Bundu, he beat Chris Algieri, but those weren't the top guys. So I had to use a little bit of intuition based on what I've seen to to determine like, oh, Errol Spence can beat Kell Brook. And I was right. I did my seven reasons. So I haven't personally seen enough of it. I've seen him fight a couple of times, but I haven't seen him enough. I've seen more Errol Spence fights leading up to the Brook fight than I have a leader Alvarez. So me personally, I can't really say that he'll beat Kovalev Ward or any of the top guys, but I like what I see from him. I like his boxing. He showed a jab. He went to the body. He does a lot, a lot of stuff right, but it's it, for me. I haven't. I just personally haven't seen enough to be like, yeah, he's the one to beat everybody. Next question: D Boy 206 Ego if Stevenson gets passed from far, which he did, and Ward gets past his rematch. Do you see a unification happening? And if so, how soon do I do I think that would happen? I'm I'm guessing you meant how soon do do you think that would happen? Ego, keep working. Thank you. Listen. I'm, I'm very consistent. After uh, two tough Kovalev fights, if Ward is victorious, I think he deserves a title defense that's not a unification. You know what I mean? And I would say the same thing for anybody else. As much as I want to see Keith Thurman versus Errol Spence Jr., I don't think he has to come back after two tough fights, Sean Porter and Danny Garcia. And yes, they were both fights, even though he did very good versus Danny Garcia. It's still tough. You know what I mean? Keeping a guy off you and the guy you didn't knock down kept coming, stuff like that. So I want to see Errol Spence and Thurman, but I don't think he has to come back after injury to that. So I would grant the same courtesy to Ward. I don't think he has to come back after two Kovalev potential wars. The first fight was a war. And if he beats him in the second fight, I don't think he has to come back and immediately fight a unification because you want to extend your career. And you got to, like, a lot of people are on some... Roman Coliseum gladiator bullshit knowing they wouldn't do the same thing if they were trainers or better yet if they were fighters you know what I mean you have to approach this game in the right light otherwise you'll have a very short shelf life so after two wars I think Ward he deserves probably a easier easier fight you know what I mean not it doesn't have to be like easy cakewalk central but even like Marcus Brown versus Shawnee Monahan winner or Sullivan Barrera, Joe Smith Jr. winner. Those aren't give me fights by any means, but Ward would open up as the favorite if he beats Kovalev. He would open up as the favorites against any of those dudes, and they're non-champions. Like, or I think Joe Smith Jr. has some version of the belt, but it's not like Adonis Stevenson. You know what I mean? So that's my thing. But eventually, I would like to see Ward Kovalev, whoever wins this second one, fight Adonis Stevenson. But same thing with Kovalev. If Kovalev beats Ward, I don't think he has to fight Adonis Stevenson right away. That's, you know what I mean? That's asking a lot. So Stevenson can fight Thomas Top Dog Williams, wait a, a gang of months, and then fight a guy he already beat, and it only goes two rounds. Meanwhile, Ward and Kovalev are trying to knock each other's noodles out and have two tough fights. And Ward fought Sullivan Barrera, and Kovalev fought Pascals, and, and you know what I mean? Different people. And. Stevenson just gets the fight from far too and then gets that fight no like you know what I mean so they get to have two Ward Kovalev tough fights and he gets the fight from far a guy he already beat it, I, like I said I think they whoever wins Ward Kovalev be it Kovalev or Ward deserves a title defense of their choice and it doesn't have to be a unification straight away that's my thoughts next question Brian Olia since Spence isn't going to fight Thurman anytime soon and he likes to stay active. What are Spence's best choices at the moment to continually stay active? Again, same same concept as the last question. He just took his tough fight, Kell Brook. I don't think he has to go in and fight a Thurman. He says he wants Thurman, but I don't think Thurman will fight him next because he's coming off an injury. And you know what I mean? They'll probably want to make that fight marinate. So there's there's a ton of options for Spence. I don't think he has to target a unification right after the Kell Brook fight. He could fight Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, Tim Bradley. I mean, Amir Khan. I don't, I don't really ever hear Amir Khan wanting to fight Spence. And he just opened up his gym to Spence. So 
I don't know. I don't know if that fight would ever really realistically happen. And same thing, Khan's coming off a brutal knockout to Canelo, so I doubt that would happen. So um, I think he should just go through the list. I can't think of everybody in the division. I, I like a fight I like for a title defense would be like a Diego Chavez. Like if you're just fighting somebody just to stay busy because Diego Chavez can box, he can bang, and he can give you some solid work. It's not going to be just an easy fight. He hasn't really had an easy night with anybody. You know what I mean? But those are my picks. I think Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, Bradley, Diego Chavez, anybody in that echelon, Lamont Peterson, if he wants that work, he wants that type of fight. Anybody like that, I would be good with. I doubt Victor Ortiz would want it. You know what I mean? So, just anybody like top 15-ish, he should be good. And then look towards a unification or bigger fights. I don't think Pacquiao is trying to fight another champion. So, it's just my thoughts. Next question, Michael Perez. What's up, Ego? Love the content. Keep it up, bro. Thank you. Do you happen to know anything about Felix Verdejo? And how do you see Easter versus Garcia assuming he beats Broner, thanks. Uh, I haven't really heard much from Felix Verdeo. Got in a motorcycle accident not too long ago. He did come back. He won that fight. He's still undefeated. Last I heard, he's going to be training in Big Bear with Golovkin's trainer, Abel Sanchez, which should be a good fit. And Felix Dia, or Felix Verdeo showed a lot of promise. I just got to see him. I want to see him look better. Like he Sometimes he's fighting run-of-the-mill guys, and... Like, at first, I was like, ah, you know what I mean? Okay, he's, he's new, you know what I mean? But he fought like a hairdresser and knocked him out. I just want to see him live up to his potential. He was getting a lot of praise, and his praise is dying down. You look at some of the other guys, like Tank Davis and other people who are getting praise, they're, like, starting to, the David Benavidez's, they're starting to, like, get the bigger fights and, and look very impressive and keep growing. And I, I really feel like Felix Verdeo his career is kind of like plateaued so hopefully this spark with him teaming up with Abel Sanchez it it, it does something where he gets back into the contentions where he, he can start having the top lightweight fights or whatever if if Garcia beats Broner the Easter fight very intriguing since they're both about billions but I would probably favor Mikey if he could beat Broner at a higher weight then I would probably favor him to beat Easter at 35. Well, you, you never know. Styles make fights. Easter is taller. I, I was, I interviewed both of them. They were next to each other. So Easter is taller than Broner and they bring a different style of fight. So it is still a very close and competitive fight. Easter has that, he's like a Paul Williams at lightweight where he's tall for the division, but he doesn't necessarily fight tall. He likes that inside work. He likes to get in close quarters and He's a dog in there. You know what I mean? Watch this fight with Richard Comey. So I don't think it's an easy fight for Garcia. But I think based on experience, based on him being a champion, and based on the momentum of if Garcia were to beat Broner at a higher weight, I think if he comes back down and makes weight 35 good, I would lean towards him to beat Easter. But I don't think that's a runaway fight either. Next question, Tunji Legba. At the age of 39, how many more fights do you think Stevenson has left? And see, with, with today's medical science and sports science and stuff, fighters can fight a lot longer if they take care of themselves. Now, I don't know Stevenson personally, his personal life, what he's doing. I know early in his life, he was not necessarily living right, righteous and stuff. He was doing some pimping or whatever, and then he got into boxing. So I don't know what he does in his personal life, but... As far as what I've seen on camera, he's not, since the Darnell Boone, he's not getting mopped up. I mean, he hasn't fought just the best competition out there, but that's preserved him, you know what I mean? So even at almost 40, he's not getting mopped up. Who, who's his tough fight? Thomas Top Dog Williams. Like, there's not, I mean, he's, he's doing his thing. So that preserves you. Now, like like I said, Kell Brook, like you look at Kell Brook's last two fights, to me took more of a toll on his career than Stevenson's last six fights because Stevenson is not getting drug into the trenches and not, I mean, he got knocked down by Fanfara, but then he came back and beat him and then beat him again just recently. So I, I don't know. I think, I think um, Stevenson has plenty of fights left in him at this pace because he hasn't really taking a lot of damage. 
Next question, Vidal Barnes, UK and her. Ego, your thoughts on Khan versus Brooke at 47 or a catch weight of 52, maybe even 154. What weight favors either fighter? Should Brooke forget 147 now? He flaked after the six versus Brooke. Oh, Spence, you meant to put. Canelo has got what's needed to beat Triple G. Um, I don't know. The whole Brooke weight situation is a mess. I told y'all he shouldn't have took his ass up to, to 160. People said, oh, you're just hating. You're hating on Golovkin for getting a money fight and all this stuff. Now you guys see it. And then, see, this is how they get you. This is how they do you. When I made the video last year, the video's still up. I don't delete. I made the video about daring to be great and how foolish it was for Khan. This is before the fight outcomes and stuff. You know what I mean? I'm talking about how Khan moved up to Canelo and Brooke was fighting Golovkin. It was before the Brooke Golovkin fight. And I'm like, this is this is dumb for him to do that because you haven't even cleaned out welterweight and you're moving up to try to slay a middleweight slayer. It's just dumb. You know what I mean? Prove you're the best at welterweight. Beat Keith Thurman and then move up or something. See if you could beat Errol Spence and then move up, at, if anything. And that's not what he did. He seen the money and like took it. And now he's he has irreversible damage done to his eye like you can get titanium plates and stuff but that doesn't reverse the psychological damage like even if it fixes it physically it doesn't reverse the experience you know what i'm saying but i don't know so i don't know what's up with his weight i think the whole weight thing is the issue but this is how they get you when i made the video last year they said i was hating they said oh you're just hating because kilbrook gonna get him a payday and glove can get a get a payday you're hating right and then a year later, when I see what what I said came true, and you guys see it, then they say, "Oh, you always you always bring it up that you're right. You're always saying I told you so. So what can I do? So I give my thoughts, which turn out to be right. And when I gave my thoughts, I'm a hater. And then when what I said turned out to be true, then you say, "Oh, I'm bragging or I told you so. Like what what can I do? You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know what Brooke." He's been all over the place with, oh, it's hard to make weight for fat and all this at 47. So I don't even know if he can make it. I don't know how hard it is or what. Khan said he's not fighting at 54. So the second part of your question, fighting at 52, 54, I don't think he's going to give Brooke that type of advantage because that's the other part of your question. What weight favors either fighter? Um, Khan, based on his durability issues and being stopped in multiple weight classes, right? I think obviously the higher the weight goes, if it's over that 150 mark, it'll benefit Brooke, who is a massive welterweight, right? But as far as the fight itself, that's your question, Con versus Brooke at 47. I literally don't care about it. I would I would watch it just as a fan of boxing to see an outcome, see how Kell Brooks' eye looks, how he looks versus Con, how Con takes a punch. But both guys messed that up. You know what I mean? It's just like picture Mayweather and Pacquiao. It's it's one thing that Pacquiao got knocked out by Marquez, you know what I mean, and had to bounce back a couple fights before getting the Mayweather fight. But imagine if Floyd Mayweather got knocked out too. Then that would ruin the Mayweather Pacquiao fight when it did happen because both of them have been knocked out. That's exactly what happened in the mega fight with Amir Khan and Kell Brook. Now and Khan had been knocked out since he was like 19 or whatever. He got an early knockout and even got knocked out after versus Danny Garcia. But there was a point in time where Khan had bounced back and he had like maybe four wins in a row and Kell Brook was undefeated. So if they would have fought then, then it still wouldn't have been bad because Khan was doing good since his early knockouts. You know what I mean? But Khan just got brutally knocked out by Canelo at a higher weight. And then Golovkin did a number on Kell Brook at a higher weight. And then he gets knocked out at, at welterweight. So it's just, I mean, what's, what's the value in that fight now? It'll make some domestic dollars. People will care about it, but I just feel like it lost plenty of luster because of both fighters been stopped violently. Next question, Chuck Dre. Yo, Ego, keep up the great work. Who do you think should be next for Amir Khan? Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, Tim Bradley, and Andre Berto. Wow, that's, that's a lot of questions. Um, 
Actually, I wouldn't mind round robin all the names you just listed. Amir Khan versus Tim Bradley. Danny Garcia Khan rematch. Danny Garcia versus Sean Porter. Andre Berto versus Danny Garcia. That's a fight that was supposed to happen that fell apart, right? Sean Porter versus Tim Bradley. So realistically, I would just take the names, get two dice, two die, and take the names you listed, and then roll one, Danny Garcia, then roll the other, Sean Porter. And that's what I would like to see, or roll the dice, Sean Porter, roll the other dice, Tim Bradley. That's what I'd like to see. I think those are all great fights, no matter how you slice it. Obviously, Khan versus Berto wouldn't happen because they're both with Virgil Hunter, but Khan versus Bradley, Khan versus Danny Garcia rematch, Khan versus Porter, I think that's a bad, bad matchup for, for Amir Khan stylistically because Porter is everything that Khan has struggled with. Good power, relentless pressure fighter, makes you uncomfortable, so I don't think it would be a good fight for Khan, like, stylistically, but, hey... Maybe he can help box him and use his height. That's just my opinion. So that's my thoughts on, on those welterweights. Next question, the main man. Why do you think fighters don't take knees when they're severely hurt? The last fight I remember seeing do that was Tim Bradley versus Provotnikov. Did he take a knee? I don't remember. And I think it just boils down to pride, really. A lot of guys are too prideful, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go out like this. And just in the moment, you don't want to give up ground. Because when you take a knee, just you let people know you're hurt. Something's wrong with you. Like Kel Brook, you don't just take a knee for no reason. Like, you know what I mean? Do the Tim Tebow, the Colin Kaepernick. You don't just do that for no reason. So a lot of people don't want to give up ground. And they're not thinking. They're not thinking it through. Because they're in the moment, and adrenaline and stuff. But like Julian J. Rock Williams. His fight with Jamal Charlo was good. He had got knocked down early. Then he got knocked out with a vicious uppercut. He should have took a long count and maybe took a second knee and try to work himself back into the fight. Instead of, if you keep trying to fight and you have no legs and you, don't, you haven't regained your, your senses, then all he has to do is load up on every shot and all you're going to do is be defensive and get knocked down again. And it just works for you. But if you take a knee, then... Maybe there's a small possibility that you can recover. You know what I mean? Take a take a knee, go down slowly, do the full, you know what I mean? Do like an eight, nine count, and then get up and then try to be your best. It's, it's better than, it's like those drunk games when people drink, take shots in Mexico or something, and then they spin around, spin them around, spin them around, and then you got to walk straight immediately after. Of course, you're going to be tumbling over, fucking up. You know what I mean? So might as well take a knee so I, I don't know I don't know you have to ask the fighters why they don't do it but to me I think it's just pride thing they don't want to do that but they are making it worse for themselves by not doing it next question Joseph Reyes Ego what do you think of the winner of Jared Swift Heard versus Austin Trout to unify with the winner of Kodo Kamagai also been studying up on a lot of Prime Kodo what do you think of Prime Kodo in my opinion after that Margarito loss he was managed horribly um, Heard Trout winner versus Kodo Kamagai winner. I'm all for that. If it's Trout, that'll be a Kodo rematch. If it's Jared Swift Heard, then that's a successful title defense. And Kodo's at 54. And if Kamagai beats him, then fuck it. Put him in there. He'll be a WBO champion. So I like that. I like that idea a lot. Prime Kodo's the ship. That's, that's the Kodo I remember. See, y'all don't remember Kodo with the hair. Kodo was a beast. I like, Kodo had a nasty body attack, very nasty, very sick left hook. Um, after the Margarito loss, he was managed horribly. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, he fought Pacquiao after and stuff. I think ultimately, I think, I don't know if it's managed horribly or whatnot, but I just think he, he lost something in that Margarito fight. Maybe, you know, I mean, it takes your confidence. You're, you're on top of the world and you take a bloody beat down like that chips away at you next question ju yo ego great work love the channel hashtag let's go champ <laughs> question at a catch weight at 128 who wins mr russell or tank davis that's a great fight but russell said he would move up to 130 so i would like to see it there i don't know i really don't know that's a good fight speed versus speed uh tank is i don't know i don't know who's bigger out of the two of them they both look a little bit short about the same size that's a good fight. 
that's a very good fight. I don't, I really don't know who would win. 128, I don't know if that's doable for Tank because he, he had trouble making the Liam Walsh weight had a weigh-in naked. So I don't even know if he can make 128, you know what I mean? So I would like to see that fight, but I think it would be more likely at 130, and I literally don't know. I would just watch that as a fan to see. I like both of them a lot. Next question comes from All About Boxing. What's up, Ego? Been a fan of your channel for a while and appreciate how you break the fight game down. Thank you. Two questions. One, is Luis Ortiz that thrashed Tony Thompson and Brian Jennings the same Luis Ortiz we see today? Do you think he has declined at all? Number two, which top heavyweight will be the first to step up to the Wilder Challenge or at least respond to his callouts? They have all been silent when his name comes up. First part of your question, I think Luis Ortiz is the same person. Obviously, he stopped David Allen, who, you know what I mean, he's decent. He, before that, didn't look good versus Malik Scott. But I think that's, yeah, I don't know what he does in his personal life. You got to attribute some of that to age. He's probably pushing 40 and inactivity and stuff. He just has to stay active because the fights you mentioned, Brian Jennings happened December the year before. And then Tony Thompson was in March. So March of 2016. So it's not really like those performances were so long ago. Like if you think about, let's say Pacquiao when he was stopping guys versus now. I mean, Pacquiao hasn't stopped anyone since like 2009 or 2011 when he stopped Cotto. So his threatening finish you power seems to be dis dissipated. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I think Ortiz will raise his level of competition if he fights a big name. So I don't. I think he's the same fighter. And when you're technically and fundamentally sound, then even as you age, you might lose some speed or reflexes and stuff but the technique doesn't really change, you know what I mean? Maybe your ability to take pressure, punches, or slowing down body shape, body type, those things change, but usually you don't lose fundamental skills, and Luis Ortiz is a skilled Cuban. That's why you see technicians like Floyd Mayweather, Bernard Hopkins, they're usually able to last, outlast the, the Brandon Rioses or Ruslan Provodnikov style of fighters because after so many wars and aging, then that's where it starts to take its toll. Part two of your question, which top heavyweight is the first to step up to the Wilder Challenge? I don't know. I mean, I think maybe Joshua, just based on his temperament, he's, he's responded a little bit in, in terms of uh, responding to Deontay Wilder's post, but I'd like to see somebody sign the dotted line and say like, you know what, I gotta fight this dude next, but it doesn't look like it'll happen. Eddie Hearn is saying the Klitschko rematch with Joshua is next. And then after they have to fight Kubrat Pulev because they're kind of backburnering him right now to make the Klitschko money fight a rematch, which was a, a fun first fight. So realistically, I don't know. Joseph Parker, he had that that fight with Raz dude, and he didn't look great. He's a new champion, so I don't think that Joseph Parker's team is in any real rush to throw him in there with Deontay Wilder. That's just my opinion, so I'm not sure. Next question comes from Anthony Heredia. Hey, Ego, keep up the good work. Three questions. Okay, three. One, do you feel Canelo's weapon for the Triple G fight will be his counter uppercut, being that we've seen that Triple G is very easily caught by uppercuts or his counter overhand rights to the jab, to a jab? Two, what do you think about a fight between Zordo, Ramirez, and Chavez Jr.? Three, do you think Kovalev is getting too confident in the Ward rematch? Let me start. I'll do a Quinn Tarantino this and start from the back and then go back up the questions. Number three, Kovalev getting too confident. I don't know. We're going to find out in two weeks because he, he's, he's doing a lot more talking. And usually what I've seen is people who excessively talk and stuff. Usually, I'm not saying Kovalev's not about that life because I think he wants to do everything he, he's, he's doing. But it sounds more like he's trying to convince himself and build himself up. Like, oh, I got you. Because there's certain things falling apart kind of in his camp. John David Jackson was going to do the Benedict Arnold and go to the ward side if the money was right and stuff like that. So it to me, I think there is a bit of worry whether Kovalev's masking it with memes and, and stuff like that. I really feel that because we've never seen it. Jean Pascal, him and Jean Pascal had bad blood too. Pascal called him a racist. He was also in his face. Like, you know what I mean? They were talking and they even did like a side bet. But I've never seen Kovalev this mad and out of character. So I think... I don't know if it's too confident, but I think he's bringing something extra into the rematch, and we'll see what that does for him. Part two of your question. At one point, Zordo Ramirez versus Chavez Jr., I really wanted to see, but 
to be honest, after Chavez Jr.'s last performance versus the smaller Canelo, he was moving up. Even though Canelo rehydrates pretty well, he was moving up. I mean, I don't really, I'm not really excited for any of those fights. You know what I mean? At one point, Badu Jack and Chavez Jr. was a signed fight. Chavez Jr. pulled out with injury. Didn't show up versus Chavez Jr. Or versus Canelo, excuse me. So, I mean, I really, Chavez is calling out Daniel Jacobs at 168. And, you know what I mean? The thought of him and Zordo and Badu Jack. I don't really care, to be honest. Because, I mean, he didn't really show me enough to let me know that he will beat any of those guys. He could have. Canelo was smaller, point blank, period. Zordo, I've met him several times. He's like a legit 6'2", 6'2 and a half. You know what I mean? He's a big dude. He's fresh. He's a champion. So, if you can't get past the smaller Canelo, who spar with Zordo, then I'm not saying they fight exactly the same way, but it's just you haven't showed me that you're really in this thing. And that's just my opinion. Number one, yeah, the uppercut for Canelo is definitely a money punch. Kill Brook showed me something. And believe it or not, I, I, I really kind of believe Canelo is possibly slicker than Kell Brook. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times, the African-American fighter is slicker than fighters from other reasons, just because of a natural rhythm that a lot, and it can't stereotype, not every black fighter is, is slick. James Kirkland's certainly not slick. There's, you know what I mean? There's been others, but by and large, there's a lot of guys that have like a natural rhythm and stuff like that. But I, I think Canelo might even be slicker, and he's naturally bigger than Kilbrook. So, yeah, the uppercut, he should definitely use it. The jab, I don't know, because I have to look at the reach. Triple G has a very good jab, and Canelo looks to have small arms, short arms, not that long, and especially in comparison to Triple G. So I think the uppercut, and I want to see Canelo use a body attack. He's vicious with combination punches, vicious with the body attack, and all that, you, you have to find a way to use the bull's aggression against it. You know what I'm saying? Run him into shit. Slow him down to the body. Make him reconsider with the jab hit him with the uppercut stuff like that so yeah those are that's what i think canelo should kind of do next question is from gregory incarnacion ego the wbc ordered a rematch between roman gonzalez and sor rung Vasai. how do you see that second fight playing out i mean it's, it's a toss-up i would favor i had roman chocolatito win in the first fight so i think he can make the better adjustments he has a better better skill set to me but it's up for grabs because Sor Rung Vasai, you don't know how, how much his confidence grew. You beat the guy who was allegedly the number one pound for pound guy, according to HBO. So that might have taken uh, Sor Rung Vasai to new heights. Like, man, I'm the man now. You know what I mean? So, And he was clearly, his punches looked more impactful. The way he was hitting Chocolatito, he knocked him down in the first round. And Chocolatito threw a million punches, but they didn't have the same effect. Sor Rung Vasai was really walking through this shit. So... It's, it's a good fight, but I think Roman showed more skill overall, and Sor Rungvisai lacks defense, so if Roman's not cut in this fight and stuff, and he just starts with a good pace, and, and there's a lot of things that went on in that first fight, the knockdown, he was bleeding profusely, so without some of those distractions, I think Roman Chocolatito can clean that up and, and get the rightful win, but we'll see, because... I'm not counting Sor Rungvisai out. He's clearly tough and clearly hitting hard. And I think he's hitting harder than Roman at the division. Next question is from Ebong Yudukon. Can Keith Thurman's power nullify Spence inside game? And if so, do you think Thurman can last the whole fight? I noticed Thurman gets tired in the later rounds and slows down, while Spence seems to have another gear and get stronger. That's a good question. That's why I want to see the fight. Spence Thurman, let's go. Let's see it. I mean, Thurman clearly has enough welterweight power to get anybody's respect. Let's be clear on that. But the thing I like about Errol Spence Jr., even when he was losing some of the early rounds, and I asked, I said this to Troy King when I was interviewing him, because he, he was like, oh, he was getting the fuck boxed out of him. And I said, was he getting dogged? And he was like, no, but he was still getting outboxed. And that's what impressed me about Errol Spence Jr. Because even though he was losing, he wasn't losing in such a landslide way that he was getting dogged and dog walked. Like, it was just bop, bop, bop. Like, for example, watch Lucas Matisse versus Ruslan Provotnikov, a guy with 
no defense really. You know, what I mean, shout out to Rusin. He's 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 a dope fighter and very hungry and um, he's a warrior. But he's not known for his defense, and it's apparent because every fight he, his face looks like trash, like he looks cut up and bleeding and peeing blood and stuff. So watch that first fight. Matisse in those first two rounds was literally battering Ruslan Provodnikov with very very hard shots, and Ruslan being tough, he just kept coming right, but. The average person probably wouldn't be able to walk through that. I did not see that with Kell Brook. I thought Kell Brook was doing good. I thought he was winning majority, not all, but majority of those early first five rounds. But to me, it wasn't. He was getting off good shots. He was tricky. He was crafty. Everything I expected. But I didn't see Errol Spence getting just mauled or dogged or destroyed in those early goings. It was clear he wasn't winning some of those rounds. But to me, it wasn't like he was just getting totally outclassed and looking a fool in there. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's say Mickey Bay versus John Molina. Mickey Bay was was doing his thing in that fight. So I didn't really see that. I seen Brooke winning, but Spence stayed composed, and that's what I like. So, yeah, it looks like Spence has a, enough, to, enough experience, especially now. That's a telling fight. That's like a Joshua Klitschko fight where you usually think the winner will go on and learn from that that adversity and he was off a nine month layoff so we'll see i, I want to see it but spence showed me he can hold it together without unraveling even when the going gets tough even when you're losing right and still come around and get the stoppage or even if he didn't get the stoppage he was clearly winning consecutive rounds in towards the championship rounds right even without the stopping, he knocked Kelbrook down and he won back to back to back rounds noticeably. He had Kelbrook looking bad, body language looking bad. So I want to see the Thurman Spence fight. It's just overall a great fight. And I told you guys who I think would win. We'll see. We have to see the fight to see it. Next question Antonio Cano 507. Who do you think is going to win, Broner versus Garcia? And I've already been public. I would lean towards Garcia, and I told you my main reason is they both got skills. Garcia's moving up. I compute all that information, right? Garcia, listen carefully, has shown me more consistent performances. And nine times out of ten, if I see a level of consistency with the fighter's performances, I would most likely pick them versus like just intuition or hoping it's the best version of them. And that's really what it is. Like Zab Judah, he fought Pauli Malignaggi. I really thought he could beat Pauli Malignaggi. But knowing Zab Jr. or Zab Judah, how he checks out sometimes, how he's not, he doesn't always keep it together. I couldn't pick him. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't pick him to beat Pauli. And he didn't. And it was actually not a good performance. And, and that was even worse because that was like, they're both from Brooklyn or whatever. So it was like the Battle of Brooklyn. And he didn't show up. So you know what I mean? Broner has showed inconsistent performances. So I got to lean towards Garcia with that. But I, in, the, in the contrary, I do not think that it's a cakewalk. Garcia is moving up five pounds. And Broner can definitely definitely beat and hurt Mikey Garcia but the way I think the way my brain is set up I usually side with the person who's giving me consistency like I didn't do an official prediction but as the fight got closer I was leaning towards Canelo over Chavez Jr. same reason consistency Canelo is consistently even in his his win with Edislandi Lada I thought he lost by a round or two even in those performances he showed me a consistent level of performance you know what i mean he wasn't getting he was getting outclassed at first but then he started to 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 shorten the gap or whatever you know what i mean so i usually go that's just how my brain works i usually go with whoever's been more consistent that's like a huge factor i look there's a lot of factors that i have when i when i pick predictions and stuff that maybe a lot of people don't i look at the psychological edge and then i look at like consistency because consistency is important Picture this. What if you had a what if your dad wasn't in your life consistency consistently, right? 
What if he was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it to your your third grade birthday party, and then he doesn't show up. Oh, I'm gonna make it to your football game, and then he doesn't show up. And then let's say your eighth grade party, he does come to that, then he disappears for years, and then it's your graduation, he misses that. That's not consistent. He's not consistently in your life. So how much trust would you have in your dad that you're graduating from college, and when he's been very spotty, you would expect him to show up? You know what I mean? I probably wouldn't. That's just me. But luckily, my pops has always been in my life. My parents are still married, so I'm just using an example. Next question, Yanmar Dad. Eagle, have you heard any updates on Brooks? I seems like by now, if he had the same injury as Golovkin, he would have had a surgery by now. Um, not necessarily. Like, I mean, it's not. It's not. He's not in the combat right now. He's he's probably taking it easy. So you're not. Once you have the the damage, is is really. As long as you're not playing football or some other contact sport that's gonna make it worse, then it'll hold up as best as possible. But ultimately, it might be something he's getting surgery on. So I haven't heard any updates, but I heard he is getting surgery on it. It's just probably a waiting game. Sometimes these surgeons, I mean, they're rich and popular, and these stars probably go to the best surgeon. So it might be a. Sometimes you have to wait. You know what I mean? Like the guy might be in Dubai performing a, a heart surgery or something. You know what I mean? We don't know. We don't know what if he's out of town. He could be on vacation, stuff like that. So. Um, usually for the best surgeons you have you might have to wait it's not just like they're at your beck and call you know what i mean so i think he is getting the surgery though next question to be my own man 200 what's good ego what up what would you say the top three divisions at the moment performance wise who's your favorite fighter from each Ooh, that's a tough question favorite or the most stacked divisions that are consistently performing welterweight 147 Heavyweight, and I don't know, 160, 154. But there's some other good. 126 is good. 130 is good. There's a lot of there's a lot of divisions. But welterweight for sure. That's because you have so many killers. Danny Garcia, he could beat some of these guys. You know what I mean? He's I don't think it's over for him. He he never got knocked out, and he's like getting knocked down and looking crazy. Even in whatever performance you think he lost or what, he's not getting mopped up and that's what we say out here in the bay sean porter same thing he's giving people tough fights he's still perfectly there then you have champions like errol spence new champion great performance over kel brook kel brook maybe is at welterweight still he's still got guys like amir khan obviously keith thurman two time he got two belts so there's just too much talent so i don't really have a favorite fighter in each division because to be honest i i like variety so I like different things from different people. Like Keith Thurman, I like how he's articulate and he speaks boxing. And to me, when he's when he's talking boxing, you're just like, oh, wow, wow. Errol Spence Jr. is super exciting in the ring and I like to watch what he does from the southpaw stance, but his personality is more chilled and laid back. You know what I mean? So a Thurman interview might be more turned up than the Errol Spence interviews, things like that. So I like different stuff. Sometimes I just want to watch Pacquiao jump in all unorthodox. So I don't really have a favorite fighter, but those are probably the top divisions that, that I'm really looking at and liking. Featherweight, you got Gary Russell, you got Oscar Valdez, you got Leo Santa Cruz, Abner Mades, you got a ton of people down there. Next question, Leno DiBiase. Why is the hate for Errol Spence so real? Everybody really thinks he looked average against Kell Brook. How do you think Spence fares up against Keith one time a year, Thurman? Oh, wow. I've already stated I, I would pick Spence to beat Thurman. Again, if the fight happened, I'm not, there's not, nothing to talk about, and I'm not bashing Thurman, I'm not bashing Spence. This is just my personal opinion on the style matchup. And there's not really much to talk about. If the fight is signed, I'll probably do a seven reasons for it and give you guys my thoughts on why. But... I don't know. Spence, he's been getting hate for a while. People are saying, look at his nipples and this and that. I mean, that's what happens when you're you're getting raved about and Floyd's co-signing you and Freddie Roach and Broner and people are saying, hey, this dude's the truth. And then you actually prove people wrong by beating Kell Brook. So, you know what I mean? You're always going to have people who hate on the situation. But I, I, don't, I don't know 
like I don't think he looked average versus Kell Brook. Like I said earlier in this video, I don't see him. I didn't see Kell Brook dogging him. In fact, I didn't even really see a point where Kell Brook noticeably knocked him off his block and hurt him so bad to the point where he started backpedaling and looking frantic or spilling over. But as soon as he turned it up and enhanced his aggression, Kell Brook started doing those things. Poor body language, wilting over, um, getting hit against the ropes, and he was just like clutching down like you know what i mean trying to block it didn't didn't look good it looked like the pressure was bursting pipes that's what they say pressure bust pipes and it looks like that's what was happening so i didn't see the performance like maybe some people some people like oh he looked bad i mean what I, he's a champion kel brooks a good ass fighter like i don't know what people expected errol spencer just i'm the truth da, 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 and knock him out in the first round that's I, that's not even realistic Next question, B Rad Grig. Ego, keep up the good work, yo. Thank you. Do you think Broner loses? He becomes a gatekeeper or journeyman? I mean, in the eyes of some fans, they might look at him. It, but it just, it really depends. Like, that's kind of a loaded question. It depends on how he loses. If he gets knocked out, eh, that's going to be worse, right? But if he loses, and, you know what I mean? There's different ways to lose. Some people lose, and people don't think you lost. Like Sean Porter. Sean Porter, he lost to Keith Thurman, but it wasn't all that embarrassing. It's not like he took Thurman's best shots, never got knocked down. So, you know what I mean? It is what it is. So, it just depends on how Broner loses. If The the worse the loss, the more severe. If it's like a Dejan Zlatisinen, then yeah, people are going to start saying, oh, you need to retire and all that journeyman, gatekeeper stuff. But, I mean, if he loses and it's a hard-fought fight for both, and he puts up a better showing than like Chavez versus Canelo, then I don't I don't think so. And the final question is from Wes P. Who are the best combination? Actually, I got two more questions. Who are the best combination punchers in the game today? My favorite is probably Canelo. I just like how he I just like his upper body movement. He's he's a level of slickness. He's learning on the job. I like how he mixes up his punches. His punch variation is sick. And if you don't believe me, go watch the Kirkland fight. What he's doing is, that's not ordinary, bro. Like, he was hitting him upstairs, downstairs, downstairs, body, body, left, right, up, uppercut. You know what I'm saying? He was just doing too much. Like, so, co uh, combination punch-wise, I like um, him. Broner is another person. When he lets his hands go, he's nasty with it. It looks flashy and everything. Javante Tank Davis, that's another person. I like when he when he starts putting them punches together and getting in the zone. Um, who else? There's a lot of people. Combination punchers. Joshua, I like Joshua when he he starts working from the jab and then letting punches go. Uh, Gary Russell, you know I like I like guys who have like athleticism and speed. Terrence Crawford, you know what I mean? Guys, like, they they hit you from, it's just weird. I don't know how to explain it. Like, even, like, Floyd Mayweather. When he start, when he lets his hands go and he, like, picks his spots, it's just, like, ridiculous because it's so surgical. Like, watch the fight with Robert Guerrero. He hit Guerrero with so many rights, but the way he varied how he threw the punch, it was ridiculous. It was, like, the same punch, right hand against a southpaw. But he was he was varying it so much, so um, that's what I would say. But Canelo's up there when it, when it comes to combination punches. I just like I like how he lets his hands go. And the final question, the real final question, George G. Boxing ego. Do you think if Mikey Garcia beats Lil Bro, Adrian Broner, that Mayweather would want to fight Mikey Garcia in the future, kind of like the Maidana situation? Hell no. I don't see that happening at all. One. Floyd was trying to sign Mikey Garcia. So that was just recently. You know what I mean? Not too long ago. Two, I think Mikey's too little. Floyd's not going to get much credit. Three, Mikey Garcia is a hell of a fighter. If he beats Broner, his profile grows. But I don't think he's a big enough name where Floyd's going to come out of retirement to fight someone that he's otherwise been pretty cool with, who's smaller, and is not going to bring any significant level of, of money you know what i'm saying like more i mean fighting keith thurman or pacquiao rematch would 
well, Pacquiao for sure, but even a Keith Thurman, I think, or Danny Garcia or Sean Porter, those fights generate more money than, than Mikey Garcia because they're at least formidable welterweights. You know what I mean? We haven't seen Mikey that hard, so that doesn't even really seem realistic to me from any way you slice it. Floyd wouldn't get credit for a Mikey Garcia fight, things like that. So that is it, Monday Mail Day. Let me know how you think I did this week. I try to get to a lot of questions. I will be back next week. And let's keep this thing rolling. Canelo Golovkin got announced for T-Mobile Arena. Stay tuned to the channel for the latest updates, thoughts, specials, all that good stuff. We working. Make sure you share the video, like the video as always. Hate, comment, and subscribe. Till next video is Ego signing off.